Frank's Red Hot is the perfect blend of flavor and heat. So you can use an entire bottle to make recipes like buffalo chicken dip or buffalo nachos. Or even things that don't start with buffalo. Frank's Red Hot. I put that shit on everything. Craig. Are you Cause... ready? Hey, stop cutting me off. Dang it. It's because CJ... Cause CJ is coming home. <laughs> that's that's as much as I'll uh, I'll subject everyone to that right there. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Yeah. How you doing, man? Um, I'm uh, Craig. Pa- I'm Hold good. on. Hold on. We always we always forget to do this. That's right. Hello and welcome. Hello and welcome to podcast versus everyone. I'm Craig Powers. With me, as always, is Jeff Neusser. And now, Jeff, you can answer. How are you doing? I, I'm doing pretty good. I had the day off today to grade papers, which which isn't really like a day off, you know. So there's uh, our, in our district we get a we get reading days one per semester, and so today today was my lucky day to grade research papers, and I got some of those done, but not as many as I would have liked. And it's actually more uh, it's more mind melting than than actual work, you know. So. I don't know. Reading, reading teenagers writing is, is both uh, rewarding and also draining. So as you might imagine. Uh, yes, I, I can imagine because reading almost anyone's writing. Uh, <laughs> well, that's what I'm, that's what I'm, my job is, right. Is to, is to try and make it so that reading anyone's writing is, is better than, you know, what it was, but I don't know. Maybe yeah, I'm please, just... please. You know, I, yeah, you know, I work in my job. I, 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 you know, I produce content. I'm also trying to pry content from non-typical writers. Um, and uh, it can be, uh, and sometimes not even, you know, like English second language. Um, and it can be a, a real fun challenge. But, you know, that's when your editing skills uh, come into play um, and how, how they get sharpened. Uh, but yeah, it's, um, yeah. So I imagine they're on the level of some of your teenagers, some of the, uh, colleagues of mine that, uh, write, um, but I welcome their writing and then on the off chance, any of them are listening, keep writing for me. <laughs> um, it's less I have to do. That's right. Um, but, uh, yeah. Uh, so Jeff, what are you drinking? So I picked up, uh, in the pocket, which is crux. It's a crux, uh, barrel aged rustic Saison ale, with and you're gonna have to help me with the pronunciation here. Brett Brettanomyces. Brettanomyces, yeah. Brettanomyces. Close, you, you, you had it. You just you just said it slowly. Well, normally like people are just like they just put like Brett on it, and I'm like okay because I know that's what it's short for, but yeah, so that I wasn't sure how to pronounce that. So anyway, it's part of their 2019 Banished series. Um, it is an Imperial Saison ale aged in Northwest red wine barrels. And so I'm like, yeah, that that sounded like kind of right up my alley with uh, sorry, with uh, Bretomyces lambicus and Bruxellensis, which probably makes some sense to you, but was ultimately meaningless to me other than the fact that I knew it would probably be a little bit tart and I hadn't had a good Saison in a while. And so so I picked this up and I am I am quite pleased with it. So yeah, uh, uh, Brettanomyces lambicus and Bruxellinus, or Bruxellinus, how you want to say it. Uh, yeah, both obviously originate from Belgium. Um, uh, it's kind of a, a they're trying to capture some of that that Belgian vibe. Uh, the lambic, obviously, trying to get some of that wild vibe in there. Um, yeah, I had, I had a chance to try that beer uh, the other night. Um, I went to uh, the Rainiers. Game. I did not get it at the Rainiers game. That's not what I'm getting at. <laughs> I was gonna but, be um, like, holy shit, you found that at a Rainiers game? <laughs> yeah. Um. Uh, although Rain, they, not 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 a bad beer selection at at the Tacoma Rainiers. Although although they banned, uh, I've I've learned we talked about the Bodie selection. They, uh, it's only in the like special dugout club now. And she got have like special, you know, Ooh. just season tickets to get to. And I'm like, oh, boo. Uh, we didn't, you know, need... you'll get, you know, you'll get season tickets eventually just for that. Not those ones, man. I'm not <laughs> shelling out that cash for minor <laughs> league baseball. Um, it, no matter how much Tacoma pride I have, but, um, but that's that for 
that's pretty much their equivalent of the Diamond Club and the Mariners. You know, they do a buffet and it's like unlimited drinks and they do like you know, service to your seat. I've looked down there, watched them bring cookies to them in the eighth inning and all that stuff. Um, and you look down and you 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 sneer at the at the bourgeoisie. Sure. Um, but but uh, but yeah. Um, but on the way back, I you know I try to make it a tradition. I stop at this beer bar that's close to my house. Um, and apparently they had it was like ten when I got there, and they were like closing up. Uh, but, um, I go there enough, uh, they see me at the door and they're like, come on in. <laughs> and, and, um, I just told him to pour me something you think I'd like. And he poured me that. And it's pretty interesting. I thought it would, I don't know if you got this note, but it, it's very bready biscuity. Um, yep. I think that probably comes from, it's such a high alcohol Saison that you're getting a lot of the malt, uh, character in there. Yeah, that was something as I as I was even looking at it initially, I was like, um, noticed the high alcohol. I think it was nine percent or something like that, which is, you know, pretty extremely high actually for a for a saison. So anyway, yeah, and it definitely catching the note of that that wild ale that you were talking about. Um, yeah, I just I love that flavor, and I hadn't had a good one in a while, so I'm glad I picked it up. Yeah, it's pretty balanced. Uh, it doesn't you, you're not you're not getting hit over the head with acidity and I think yeah. it's a pretty solid beverage. Yeah, I like it. How would you also, rate it? Oh. I don't I don't know, but here's what I also know. It yeah, it has had a wax top and a cork in it, which means it is extra fancy. So. Which means that's really fucking annoying. Don't do that. <laughs> pick I one. I, well, and I'm just like, you know, I'm sitting here with the wax cap trying to get, you know, I've, I've got like a knife trying to break it up. And then I'm like digging in there with my bottle opener that I've, my crappy little bottle opener I've got down here at my downstairs desk. And I'm just like, oh, it's starting to piss me off. And then I finally got it off. I'm like, okay, good. And then I look, I'm like, shit, there's a cork, you know? And so then I'm like glad that my, my little bottle opener also has a, has a corkscrew on it. So anyway. Yeah. Yeah. That's, you know, there's uh, some Belgian uh, Lambic producers that, uh, they do a, a, a cap and cork instead of the big cage and cork that mm-hmm. you'll see some of the bears. And so some of the American uh, beer makers have have taken to doing that cap and cork thing. Degard does cap and cork for all of their beers. Um, but uh, throwing the wax on it is just overkill. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm just like, come on, man. But we're, hey, we're fancy. For fancy. That's got to be worth at least. I mean, I mean, really, that's got to be worth at least another. I don't know, two dollars retail, three dollars retail to throw the wax on top. I mean, some. I mean, some of those. Uh, I mean, some of those cages can cost like literally a dollar each. Um, and so maybe a cork and cap and wax might, you know. It might I'm just thinking like how many people walk past it in the aisle and then go, "Ooh, it's got wax on top." Oh, I guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> and then they're like, right and then they're like oh well i boy i'll bet that beer's really good it's got wax on top yes which that's is, how you know that's how you know a beer's good yeah absolutely <laughs> so uh how, how are we gonna rate that thing what what am i rating it out of or what's yeah. the what's our scale tonight Ooh, that's a good question uh i haven't thought about it at all oh <sighs> out of out of six weird. tools how many <laughs> how many does that Saison have? Out of out of six tools. Yeah. Uh boy, you're you've now you've now sort of like thrown my brain into like 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 it's seizing up on me because now we're on a scale of six instead of a scale of five. That's all of a sudden that's like having me do like some like you know, like in uh, math class and when you were growing up when they'd be like, What would like a base twelve world look like? You know, to try and get you to understand numbers and and then you were just like, what the hell? Like 12? Like, anyway, that's what I'm feeling right now. Uh, let's go with uh, out of six. Let, let's go with like four and a half out of six, which would be like the equivalent of like oh, we don't need four to, to the equivalent. something out of five. But this is I don't not know. out of five. It's out of six tools. But it's out of six. It's out of six. So there's no equivalent. It's like a, okay, so this is like okay, hang on, hang on. Let me rethink this then. So we're stop thinking trying like, to stop trying to make it equivalent to out of five yeah. Minshew mustaches. Yeah, or whatever so we're like doing. thinking in terms this is of out tools, of six right? tools. Yes. All right, so is uh, let me see. I, I'm trying to think of like if I, so if I rated this like a five tool player, I'm trying to think of like which tool it would be missing. 
I don't know, maybe like minus one tool because I had to fight to get it open. How about that? Yeah. The it's packaging a one, is pen, it's a one tool to penalty say. for packaging. Yeah, there we go. All right. Uh well drinking? well, I am drinking uh also uh a beer that has probably uh Betonomyces lambicus in it. Um it is uh a beer by McKellar, and it is called Spontan Cherry Fredericksall. Um, so Fredericksall is a kind of cherry, a sweet cherry. Um, so this is a Spontan, their Spontan series, which is short for spontaneous, or it might just be spontaneous in, uh, in Danish. I don't, I don't know. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, th- yeah, this is... Um, Spontaneously fermented beer in the style of uh, Belgian Lambic um, and then aged on top of uh, Frederick's all cherries. Um, they give it this like deep, dark color, like dark, dark red, like blood before it hits, hits oxygen red. Um, and it, it's pretty tasty. Uh, uh, McKellar's a pretty interesting brewery. Um, McKellar. Uh, McKellar was started by a guy named Mikkel from um, Denmark, and uh, he was for many years a what you call a gypsy brewer, uh, which means he bounced from bre- he went to various breweries to brew his beer. He didn't brew his um, beer at uh, at one place. Um, he did you know hit the same spots a few times, but he would just brew his beer at all sorts of places and use their facilities. And, uh, and so he, that's what we call a gypsy brewer. Um, there's also, uh, other versions. There's, you know, like contract brewers where the brewer just gives a recipe to another brewer and has it make it for them. Um, cause they have a larger facility or something. Um, but, um, uh, so, uh, McKellar's pretty interesting. He brews a ton of different beers. He actually has, uh, Mikkel has his, own production brewery now in uh, San Diego, um, in Alesmith's old brewery, because uh, he was brewing at Alesmith quite a bit, and then they moved to a bigger facility, so he took over their old facility. Uh, so you can actually go to um, their tap room in uh, the Miramar area of San Diego now, and uh, there's also McKellar bars throughout the world. Um, there's one in uh, in the U.S. There's one in San Francisco. Um, and then there's uh, there's all over cities in Asia. There, there's one in Singapore. I think there's like one in Bangkok and like, uh, you know, and there's ones in Japan and Korea. And then there's ones all over Europe. I, I went to one in uh, Barcelona. Um, so he he's he's done that approach for a while just to open up um, uh, restaurant uh, bars. And, and now he's got his own uh, a brewery as well. Um, so, yeah, it's it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, uh, uh, um, there's also an interesting story you may have heard about, uh, evil twin brewing. Um, so, uh, that is actually, um, the McKellar brewery breweries, uh, twin brother. Uh, they had a, and I would encourage you to look up their story on the New York times. That's an article from about four or five years ago. Um, it details how they had a huge falling out um, because uh, um, when um, uh, the evil twin brewer Giuseppe uh, started making his uh, own beer, he was he was selling it or he was I'm sorry, he was had a beer shop and he was the exclusive uh, retailer for um, McKellar beer. And then McKellar opened up their own uh bar like just down the street and and started selling their beer there and so basically cut into his business um and so they've had a falling out ever since and so he started his own gypsy brewery and called it um uh and called it evil twin uh, as a reference to uh being mikhail mikhail's evil twin um so uh yeah and he now has his own building building his own production facility in brooklyn and has a bar called torst in brooklyn which is similar to mckellar bar honestly um so yeah it's pretty interesting that two brothers they do the same thing uh they don't really get along uh mckellar evil twin might you might see their beer more often a little more accessible they have some like more 
affordable offerings and probably better beer on on balance overall uh, than McKellar. But uh, this McKellar Spont and Cherry is quite good. Um, I'll give it a I'll give it five tools out of six. You know, it's trying to be a lambic. It's not quite there. Um, it, it's not not quite as funky, but uh, the cherry is excellent in it, and um, it's very well done. And uh, yeah, I, I, again, I encourage you to go look up that New York Times story. Just look for just search McKellar Evil Twin New York Times. It'll it'll probably come up. Um, and we are all the beneficiaries because <laughs> because they're trying to outdo each other and. We get good beer out of both yeah, of them. Yeah, most of the time. Uh, some yeah. Of, both of them make some pretty shitty beer, too. I do like uh, McKellar. The one beer I picked up when I was down in California last year was their Windy Hill New England-style IPA, which I thought was outstanding. Yeah, uh, that's one they're producing regularly. Yeah, now. yeah. Can't, um, I, haven't, I haven't seen it up here, but, um, but it was really good. Well, yeah, the San Diego stuff, they only um, distribute in California. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Right. It's their other stuff is with Shelton Brothers distribution, so it ends up everywhere. But their San Diego stuff is, is just local distribution. So yeah, so yeah, that that's that's what we're drinking. Uh, I'll I'll admit, um, I didn't. Uh, as you know, Jeff, I where I spent my afternoon uh, uh, trying to buy a car. <laughs> yeah. And um, uh, so, or in my in my most of my evening. Uh, so I, uh, I, I, I didn't get the chance to work out today, so I'm limiting myself to a single beer. And so my sidecar beverage is, is a, uh, lime LaCroix tonight. <laughs> that's good. I like that. Well, that's good. I'm only having one tonight too, but not because of that, just cause that's all I grabbed out of the fridge and I'd have to walk back upstairs to get another one. So I couldn't bear the thought of not drinking something. So yeah, no, I, I, I feel you. Yeah. I'm the same way. I'm still recovering from, uh, my high intensity interval training on Monday, but that that's another story for another podcast, probably. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was good. Um I'm I'm finally two days later starting to walk normal again. So anyway. Anyway, bond to other things. How about CJ Ellaby? Yeah, let's talk about that guy. Yeah. I mean breaking news. Breaking news. Big surprise. Shocking. Um, He's coming back to WSU for his sophomore <gasps> season. <gasps> How exciting. It is exciting. I don't mean to make fun of that. It's actually super exciting. No, it's a, you know, if, I mean, if he was good enough to get drafted and that was determined, then good for him. But uh, definitely um, if, you know, if uh, Kyle Smith's going to make the team better next year, uh, CJ Ellaby is definitely a guy that he wanted. Uh, definitely a, a classic uh Kyle Smith player, a six tool player, as we might say. Yeah, I think it, it kind of cracked me up how uh, so I, I kind of wrote about it, too, when I wrote my uh, wrote my piece on Smith's recruiting philosophy. I, I kind of like thought the six tool thing was a little funny just because it's like, I mean, doesn't everybody like isn't that what everybody would love to have? Right. I mean, wouldn't you love to have all of your players able to dribble, shoot, pass, you know, I mean, defend all rebound, all those, you know, the six different tools. Right. I mean, it's like everybody wants that. But I, you know, I do think that the way the way he sets up a team places a little bit more of a premium on that versus, um, you know, maybe having guys who specialize a little bit you know, surrounding someone who maybe is a little more well-rounded. So um, I think he placed a little bit more of a premium on every guy being able to do multiple things. And, and I think, by the way, you can really see that in the guys that he recruited too. I mean, I think those guys are all um, sort of versatile players. So for Ellaby to come back, who is truly, truly um, a really high level, you know, versatile player, um, is, is absolutely, you know, massive. And, and I think that Smith, um, I think Smith is, is, is the coach to get the most out of him. One of the things that I, you know, I thought I noticed with Ellaby last year and, and I don't know if this is necessarily true or if this is just anecdotal, um, you, you know, or, or if you become sort of a prisoner of the moment, you know, as you're watching the games, but you know, one of the things I thought I noticed about Ellaby sort of early in the year was that, um, you know, he, he wasn't really tentative, but he was fairly conservative with, you know, the passes he would make, um, a lot of hustle on defense, 
um, you know, a, a little, you know, better shot selection with the notable exception of the Seattle game. That, that was sort of a different deal because Franks was out and he was playing in Seattle. Seattle, yeah, she was in Kent, but whatever. Um, you know, that game he sort of shot a whole bunch, but it seemed like the other games, you know, he, he was sort of selective with his shots. He was, you know, maybe a little more conservative with his passes and and, and things like that. Um, and it really seemed like as the year went on and the season really went off the rails that he took a lot more liberty. Um, you know, it just sort of when it became clear there wasn't a lot of accountability um, coming from the bench. And, and that's when, you know, he saw, I, I, I felt like I saw more sloppy turnovers more you know maybe questionable shots things like that so um you know to kind of rein him back in with um kyle smith before he had gotten too far off the rails with ernie kennedy is a really good thing i think you know smith is going to demand um he's going to demand execution he's going to demand accountability um and and i don't know lb seems like the kind of guy who who will really thrive in that so i'm super excited super super excited to see what he'll do under kyle smith yeah, and, and typically um, the biggest jump for a player is their freshman and sophomore year. Uh, I, I think some of what – some of uh, Ellaby's uh, uh, downturn late in the season, you know, uh, it's pretty typical of freshmen that play high minutes uh, kind of struggle down the stretch. Uh, I think you saw it with Malachi Flynn his freshman year yep. as well. Uh, and he led the team in minutes. Yeah. Min- minutes, actual minutes played. I don't know what his average was, but – but he definitely was the team leader in uh, minute percentage of minutes played on the season, so 77%. Yeah, and, and, and fatigue can play a part with you know turnovers and and whatever. So and 77% of minutes is quite a lot for a guy uh, coming out of high school. And um, I, all these all the, these guys do play a lot of AAU and stuff. So there's but it's a little more grinding. The intensity is not the yeah, same. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah, this, the, it, and going to school Tuesday, Thursday games or whatever, Wednesday, Sunday games, whatever the hell they are now. Um, but yeah, you know, it's yeah, obviously a different level of intensity. Uh, you're no longer the best guy on the floor. Uh, you're, you're, you're one of the guys and you're grinding and bumping and, and playing your hardest. But yeah, so yeah, I think, um, a lot of what you said, definitely true. Um, you know, he did. He definitely is. I think his usage went up, and 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 obviously Franks was missing some games, and um, and he was just you know out there uh, really as the only uh, guy that could you know even cr- partially create his own shot. So, um, so it was it, it, he had a lot put on him as a freshman, um, especially as a freshman that wasn't you know initially regarded as a guy that would have that impact. So. Um, you know, you, you can see him wearing down and then obviously just the team losing control, but, but yeah, um, he's got, he's got everything, um, that, that you would want in a, in a player in Kyle Smith's system. He's, he's got the body to be a good defensive player. And I think he has, you know, I think he's got the nose for it too. He, he, he played some good defense when, when, when it was there to be played. Uh, um, and you could see that he had the ability, he, he would, he he's a a solid shot like knows for the ball. He's got a solid shot solid shot blocker for for his size and obviously a great rebounder for his size and um and he's got that kind of uh, good good size to play that swing uh, position with you know he's got good range and um, the ability to uh, take guys off the dribble. So um, I mean he's going to be easily our um, I assume our best player to next year, um, even with, you know, regardless of the guys that come in, he, he'll be the best player and he'll be the focal point of the offense. And um, so it's excellent to have him back. Very excited. Yeah. I'm super curious to see how Smith is actually going to use him. Um, and just like, you know, is just the, the ways in which um, maybe he tries to get him the ball, get him the ball to make things happen in the positions on the floor in which he gets it. Um, you know, I'm not, I, I I haven't really had much of a chance yet. And this is part of my summer, my sort of on my summer to do list, but to spend some time really familiarizing myself with Smith's offense, um, you know, at its core, it, it seems like it's, it's sort of a Princeton style, Princeton style deal, um, although I think, and again, this is, you know, it, it, it's kind of hard to, it, it's hard to say until I watch, but my understanding is that they went maybe a little more away from that, not, not necessarily in, in principle, but just in terms of execution, because he had Frankie Ferrari, who was, who was such a good, 
um, ball handler and, and, and penetrator and playmaker. Um, you know, maybe you didn't, it, it, there was a little more, you know, isolation than what, you know, he, he would necessarily prefer or whatever. It, and in that way, he seems like a bit of a flexible coach in terms of, uh, of adapting to the personnel in hand. Um, you know, I, I don't think looking at the roster, he has, um, a, a playmaking, creating point guard in the mold of, of Ferrari, a guy who, you know, I, I can't remember, but I think his assist rate was over 30 percent. It, it was something like that where um, he was assisting on, you know, more than 30 percent of, of his teammates makes um, when he was on the floor. So, you know, I, I don't think there's a guy on the roster who fits that bill. Um, I don't think Bonton fits fits that kind of point guard role. I mean, I think he's definitely a guy who can be a playmaker, but I don't know that he's. Um, I'm that kind of guy who's, who, you know, sort of specializes in setting up teammates. So, um, I, I think a lot of it's going to flow through Ellaby and, and like I said, I'm curious to see, um, what he does to put Ellaby in positions to, um, you know, to make some things happen. And, and my guess is we'll, we'll probably see him in a lot of different, different kinds of positions, um, in a way to do that. And, and you know, and the other thing is I'm not, I'm not even sure how much creativity offensively we're going to see. Um, you know, one of the things that, that Smith made clear really off, off the bat was that the defense had to get better, you know? And so when your when your defense is, you know, ranked, whatever it was, you know, 300 or whatever in, uh, adjusted defensive efficiency, you know, you got to fix that first and that that's going to take time and that's going to take effort. And, and one of the things about, um, you know, college, you know, college athletics is that you only have so much practice time. And so, you know, the, the things he's going to emphasize, um, you know, if he's, if he's truly committed to emphasizing defense and I, and I really believe that he is, you know, that that's going to leave less time for the offense, which is kind of the Dick Bennett thing, right? Where you go, you know, we're going to spend all this time on, on defensive principles and we're just going to run a, a pretty simple, you know, mover blocker scheme, you know, to, to make it easy to execute. And, and, you know, we're just going to run it for 30 seconds. And, you know, when we get a good shot, we get a good shot. And, you know, if we, if we haven't had a, you know, a, a good look in the last, you know, seven, eight seconds, then, you know, we're just going to give the ball to the best guy and just tell him to do something. So I have a feeling we might see some of that next year offensively, but I don't know. So like I said, curious, curious to see how it goes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, that, you know, I think back to the, the Dick Bennett teams, his three years that um, they, they, uh, I don't know if it was famously, but I know I, I had, you know, a lot of friends that, uh, worked with the team and they would say how you know especially uh uh dick's his last couple years his last year in particular they they uh they lost a lot of close games and he uh it but they apparently like they never practice late game situations in practice um because like you said like uh dick was just trying to focus on the defense and let everything else happen and and then, you know, when Tony came in the next year, all those guys knew the defense and, and they were, you know, they, they, they were ready to, you know, expand offensively. But, um, but yeah, like, you know, uh, you, you, when you're a coach, and you have that limited practice time, you got to pick and choose what you're going to work on and maybe f- focusing like that much time on the last 15 seconds of the game or focusing, you know, on, on getting some complicated offense in when, when your team can't even stop anybody. Uh, it's, it's, and as we've said before, it's easier to fix a defense than an offense. Um, you can get guys of a certain athletic caliber and length and, and you can, and you can te- coach them up to play well in defense a lot easier than you can coach them up to play well in offense. So, um, it, it seems like, uh, just Smith's rhetoric and, and everything he's said so far that that's what they're doing. Uh, and that's what, you know, what the players have said that, that that's, what's going to be going to be the focus. So, um uh yeah it'll be interesting to see uh, and and LB fits that fits that mold of of a guy who's got the got the tools to be a, a very good if not great defensive player and he seems like a coachable kid i mean i you know listen i don't have any kind of special insight <laughs> you know i don't um i do have sources but i don't have i don't have any insight into LB so you know it, but he seems like just kind of watching him you know he seems like a coachable kid he seems like someone who um, you know, who, who maybe you can coach kind of hard and, and he'll respond to, um, I, I don't know, this is the hunch I have just, and again, just kind of watching him again, it seemed like early in the year, he kind of was, was trying to play, you know, quote unquote, you know, the right way. 
Um, and then, you know, as the year went on, it seemed like he just kind of was like, like everybody else was just like, whatever, you know, fuck it, who cares? You know, we're getting killed anyway, and <laughs> I'm just going to do what I do. So, um, like I said, curious to see how he responds to all of that. And, and very exciting, you know, I mean, it, listen, the team, the team would be much, 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 much worse off without him. And, uh, yep. you know, so I think that. Um, you know, having him back, I, you know, I think it does give us a chance to potentially really sort of evaluate Kyle Smith's first year fairly. Um, you know, if LB had left, I think then you're looking at, you know, I mean, how do we even really evaluate this with a, with a short recruiting class? And, you know, I mean, you know, the, the number of guys who are returning, I mean, at this point, you know, you're looking at probably, I mean, so first of all, the recruiting class is seven now. Um, and that, doesn't include Nigel John, who may or may not be sticking with his commitment. Um, there was uh, a report out of Pittsburgh that Pitt had offered him, so we'll see kind of how that goes. Um, so if he doesn't end up sticking around, you still you've got seven out of, and then that'll give you a, a roster of twelve, assuming Ahmed Ali comes back. And so you're talking seven out of twelve guys, you know, even if Nigel John doesn't come, um, that are new. So so it's definitely going to be new. It's definitely going to be a little bit weird. Um, you know, still super bummed out about Marvin can. I mean, we don't need to rehash that, but, um, you know, just, yeah, it's, I think Ellaby gives you a chance to maybe, um, you know, be pretty good. Cause you think that, I mean, I don't know, somebody kind of asked me to quantify what his return meant. And, and I was like, I don't know, a couple wins, you know, maybe something like that, you know, two to three wins that you wouldn't have gotten without, um, if you didn't have him on the team, I, I don't know that I'd go much higher than that, but, but I think, I think I feel pretty comfortable saying you get probably two or three more wins with him on the roster. Yeah, definitely. And, 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 in basketball, it's harder. I mean, there's lots of statisticians that work on this, but it's really hard to quantify, um, an individual player's impact at times to, to the overall team success. Um, you know, because we, you know, we see things like uh, the Warriors playing really well without arguably the best player in the world, <laughs> you know, and playing arguably better than they did without the best when they had the best player in the world. Uh, so, you know, it's 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 hard to quantify just how uh, basketball's got a lot of uh, it, it. The way players impact each other, um, um, and, and and how a focal point a. a a very talented player can uh, sort of bring um, bring up uh, bring up the rest of the team. Uh, you know, I think LB would probably be particularly offensively, and and then in rebounding, um, he he just gives them that you know that extra oomph. You know, if uh, you you got a guy that can grab a board and then and then push the ball up at the same time, obviously, I don't think Smith's going to be running an offense where he's going to be pushing the ball up a lot, but um, he's still a guy that can do that and. Uh, it's it that's a a weapon to have it frees up other guys um frees up other guys from crashing the glass um and then it's the same as if you know if you have a shot blocker in the middle who just kind of um who can shut down drives with by just his existence and and lb can just attract attention um on offense and then he can uh, uh you know lock down the boards from a you know the three or two spot on on defense so it's it's a, uh, it's, he's just a, a nice tool to have. And like you said, two to three wins, I think that makes sense. And again, it's really hard to quantify something like that. Um, but yeah, so, um, yay, CJ up, he's back. Um, <laughs> so what, or yeah, he's coming back. We, I mean, we knew it was going to happen, but whatever, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, no, no one's surprised, but still is, you know, it's more of a sigh of relief. Um, yeah. uh, you know, not for him. I, I would have been happy for him if he yeah. was getting drafted and playing. In oh, the NBA, for sure. But, but for, but sure. for, for W, I, I think it'll be uh, good for him. It's probably great for him to work out for some teams and, and get some feedback on his yeah. game. I think that actually helps him out. At, Definitely. You know, that's, that's a benefit for WSU, um, to have a guy that get that kind of coaching and feedback for, you know, n no cost to WSU whatsoever. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, but yeah, so. Uh, so when you think when LB uh, comes back, um, you know, this is kind of a weird question just for the athletes, but uh, do you think he'd be spending more time in Moscow or Pullman? <laughs> I, I think he'll probably be in Pullman, Craig, because, you know, Pullman is the place to be. Not really Moscow, although you'd never know it if you read The Athletic. Yeah, so obviously we're a little late on this. Um, we meant to talk about it last week, but we already had an hour and 15-minute podcast without without it. Um, 
so yeah, the uh, an article in the Athletic. Um, I don't even remember what it's about anymore. <laughs> It was, it was about Kyle Smith and yeah, of course, nerd ball okay, it was slash the, it was data raid the, and the data raid article. Yeah. Um. So they made the point to write that most students in Pullman spend a oh, hold lot on. of their I'll, time. I'll read it word. Okay, for just word if just you read want. it word. You read it read it word for word. Okay. So it starts like this. It goes, if Washington State isn't the toughest power conference job in the country, it's certainly on the short list. Okay. I mean. I agree with that. All right, whatever. (laughs) Pullman, surrounded by rolling wheat and legume fields on the far eastern edge of the state, is basically a synonym for remote. Okay. The city does have an airport, which features just one operating commercial airline, Horizon, that only flies to and from Seattle four times a day. Now, by the way, when I read that, I thought, I don't know, four sounds like a lot to me, like... That seems like a lot of flights to and from Seattle in one day. Well, maybe it's going to Pullman. It's only one city it flies to. Maybe, maybe. I Does, can you fly it somewhere else from Pullman? Is I, it, I don't. I, I feel like you can. I, I think you can. I think you can. Anyway, here we go. Don't think about flying there in this fall, however, as the airport will be closed for renovations. Sad emoji. Wazoo students traditionally, now this is where it really goes off the rails though. So, I mean, before that we kind of go, okay, all right. I could, I, you know, I could see that. Um, but this is where it goes off the rails. Uh, Wazoo students traditionally have driven 15 miles across the Idaho border to Moscow to find a good time. Now, it's not I don't 15 know about, miles, first of all. first of all, it's not 15 miles. Second of all, in, 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 in what world is that tradition since like 1980? Yeah. Since the drinking age was raised in idaho to 21 which was when like 80 something yeah yeah so like i don't know about you okay so anyway we'll come back to this okay so (laughs) i don't know about you but i never went to moscow to find a good time but we will continue um imagine that recruiting pitch come to washington state where you can hang out near the idaho campus Pullman is home to about 33,000 people, according to the U.S. Census, with students accounting for most of that. The husband of the longtime basketball secretary is the town fire chief. The team's PA announcer is also the mayor. Quote, for better or worse, quote, Pollard says, this is Jeff Pollard, there's really not that much to do in Pullman. It's hard to build any hype here, which is such bullshit, but we'll come back to that. All of which is a long way of saying this isn't exactly a basketball hotbed. The Cougars have only made blah, 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 blah. So anyway, it's just, yeah. So there you go. So uh, this is a hard job because we all apparently go to Moscow in order to party, which go ahead, Craig, the floor is yours. Well, okay. I'll tell you what I went to Moscow for when I was in school uh, to go to Walmart and to go to Winco. And one time I, uh, they had a, they had a, they had the plus mall, um, and the Plus Small, which uh, knew what you wanted, and they had it. Um, if you had TV uh, when I went to school, then you'll you'll get that. But uh, there was there was also a restaurant called Lefties in the Plus Small, where they had a challenge where you'd eat a two pound after it was cooked burger, plus fries and a shake in less than an hour. One of my friends did it, um, held it down for about five seconds longer than the one minute that was required. Um, but he did it, and he got a shirt and a, and his name on a plaque, and now the restaurant's not there anymore. Um, I know some folks went there. I mean, I, I see maybe you went over there uh, if you, when your parents were in town and they were buying buying dinner. Uh, you might have went to uh, I don't know, uh, Wingers or or Applebee's or <laughs> or I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I mean, definitely you could find a chain restaurant in Moscow. Yeah. Um, and, Great. And, and I'll say, like, as an adult, like, there's more, like, adult restaurants in Moscow. Like, that, like if you want, like, a fine dining as much as you can get on the Palouse experience, like, you know, there's, like, Black Cypress in Pullman. And then there's there's more, like, you know, a breakfast club is great in Moscow. That's a great breakfast place. And, uh, you know, there's some nice places over there. Um, there's a nice, like, uh, craft beer place uh that i like called tap tap house now but honestly like you're not going to any of those places like if if you're in pullman when you can walk like and and i i think maybe once we went over to venture over to the like um one of the bars that's like has like pool tables um and but we could like we knew we had to drive back 
So like we weren't doing much. Like we we're like, well, okay, this is boring. Um, I remember you could still smoke in the bar, so that was kind of weird. And so we 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 went back, and it's like, why would I want to drive over to Moscow to go to a a college bar when I there's three college bars on the hill <laughs> within walking distance. within walking distance of my apartment <laughs> or dorm or fraternity or sorority like it's like like what that doesn't make any sense to me no one like people are not driving over to moscow regularly to go to the bars now i no. could see i can see the athletes like nobody is doing nobody is doing that well i could see the athletes Liter- just because like literally nobody wanna... is like hey let's go to moscow to party or or let's go to moscow to go to the bars like i mean nobody is doing that Okay, yeah. you talk about the athlete thing, which I think there's maybe some legitimacy to because they make friends with each other and whatever. Well, they make, maybe you don't, you don't want to go out where you're going to get recognized. Right, like, right. and they train with each other during the summer, you know, the like especially the basketball players, you know, they'll play pickup with each other during the summer, you know, whatever. But it's like, like literally nobody I knew was like, hey, you know what let's do tonight? Let's drive to Moscow. Let's drive on that, you know, godforsaken, dangerous ass two lane highway over to Moscow and get wasted so that then we can drive back on a dangerous ass two lane highway at, you know, two in the morning when the bars close, like literally nobody is doing that. Yeah. It's a, yeah, it's and ridiculous. I attended zero parties in Moscow, by the way. Oh yeah. I had a, I had, I knew someone that uh, lived uh, in Moscow uh, my senior year um, cause he was working for WSU. He had graduating. He was working for WSU. So I went over there, but we never even went out in Moscow. We like, if I went over and we drank at his house, but, uh, we would go out in Pullman. Um, guys, I don't know, like it's, it's, there's college bars and, uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if there's as good a college bar as Valhalla or the Coug over there. So, um, and they don't have the ladder anymore. Um, so, uh, at what was it? CJ's or one of those. Um, so I, I, yeah, I, it's just such a ridiculous statement. Um, and then, uh, Jeff, why don't you, uh, address that point that Mr. Pollard made yeah. that, um, you can't build hype in Pullman. It's hard to build any hype here. Well, here's the thing. Okay. So, I mean, I can address it, but I'm going to be turning it back over to you because you were actually there when there was, when there was hype last time. You know, it's like, no, it's not that hard to build hype, win some shit and people will show up like that's it. Like that is all that is like, like if, if you look at the football stuff, the game day stuff, if you look back to the Bennett years, like all you got to do is win and people will show up, particularly students, dude, students are like, dude, what the hell else we got to do now? You do have to give them a reason to show up. They're not just going to, sh- I mean, Ernie Kent just thought they would all show up just because like, Oh, it's, yeah, I don't know what he thought, but like it's Pullman and there's nothing else to do. So of course they'll come to a basketball game, which is not true because, well, you could say there's nothing else to do, but there's definitely other things to do. Like all the other stuff we were just talking about. You well, know? And like, I mean, come on, <laughs> like it's about like, uh, you you put like everyone around you is the same age as you like you it's like you always have something to do like you like you yeah you just like you figure out stuff to do 100 percent and, and like it's not it's not that crazy like um yeah it's just it, it it doesn't make any sense but yeah the hype thing so when i was in school uh we had like five thousand people that would come to every basketball game just students five to six thousand people yep like like a like a, a, almost a third of the student body would come to basketball every single basketball game, and and so so like and all it took was like half a year of winning for that to start happening. So the the first the, the half a year the, of winning and beat Gonzaga. When, when, Those yeah, are the two I've, things. But Gonzaga, the the students filled it up for that, and the, the, all the team was was seven and one. They were like six and one, and they hadn't beaten anybody. And they had just lost to Utah, but pre Pac-12 Utah. Um, and so they, you know, they, they, for all we knew, they were just frauds with their six and zero start or whatever. And um, but they came in and th- that was like the stadium sold out. And granted, you know, like probably a, a third of those were Gonzaga fans, but the Gonzaga fans couldn't get into the student section. 
Um, you know, we probably had a few guest passes that were in there, but it was students, man. That that, that was a completely full, and that was after a six and zero start after they were last in the Pac-10 the year before. So like there was so much hype, and then they beat Gonzaga, and then you have uh, a little bit later in the season, UW comes to town. UW's not even ranked or anything like, uh, uh, and and we're I think ranked at that point. But there's so many students that show up, students were turned away. Like in, in the enormous student section that was Beasley at the time, like 6,000 people, student, more than 6,000 students came in. Like they had to turn students away. And, and that game was also coming off a loss. Now they were 15 and three at that point. I'm looking at the, I'm looking at the season right now, but they were just coming off an overtime loss to Stanford too. So it's like, you know, they're coming off a loss, but they were 15 and three and people at Washington's there and like the whole place is listen, like, and I know this is hard for Jeff Pollard to imagine. And and I don't mean this to rip on Pollard because, you know, the dude has like, he, he just doesn't under, like, he doesn't know. He really doesn't have any context for what it can be like you and I do, you know, so he is speaking from what he knows. And and in fact, my personal theory on the Moscow thing is that somehow that came from Pollard (laughs) that like, and, and, you know, Jeff Pollard doesn't strike me as the partying type for, for various reasons. So, you, you know, maybe that came from him too, but it's just like, he just has no idea what it can be. And it sucks by the way, that, that that's his frame of reference, right? Like it absolutely blows that, you know, the dude's like in his fourth year and he's just like, yeah, you know, it's hard to build hype. And it's like, what the hell? You literally just have to win for half. Like you just have to win some games. Like, like, like win like seven or eight games to start the year. And maybe people will start to think this is kind of cool. You know I mean? It's like, it's not. And, and by the way, this year, I think it'll be easier to do that a little bit if they can start well. Um, just because I think, you know, you get a new coach. People are a little more, um, you, you know, uh, they're they're basically they're, they're a little more open to to embracing the idea that that this is different, you know, and this is something we should see, um, versus like you know two years ago with Ernie where you know they go and win the Wooden Classic and it still doesn't really seem to move the needle too much because that was after, you know, you know three years of, of garbage. Right. So it's, it's hard to convince people after three years of garbage that you're moving the needle. But, um, you know, I think Smith will, Smith will be able to, to do that. And, and, you know, and I think that's kind of what, what Bennett had too. It wasn't, you know, his dad was the coach for three years before that. Um, you know, and as you mentioned, they had a whole, you know, they, they lost a bunch of games the year before, but man, they lost a lot of really, 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 really close games. And, and I also think there was, you know, people were even, even then sort of embracing the identity of, you know, the pack line and, and Bennett ball and all that stuff. And and so I think when you start to put those things together and start to have some success with it, with a fairly young core, um, you know, all those things allow people to embrace it. And, and I think that, you know, you might see some similar things with Smith. I'm not saying they'll, you know, they'll win a ton of games or anything like that, but if they can start reasonably well, you know, I think you'll see some people, you know, I think you'll see some people turn out, um, you know, and, and I don't think it'll take a whole lot either. Well, because college basketball games are fun. Students like going to them. Like, like, Absolutely. Like they, they were like when 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 Bennett, Tony Bennett's years, when and even in Dick Bennett's years when they were losing close games, like still it was like it was crazy intense atmosphere. Like Beasley can be an amazing, loud. Oh, place. yeah. Like it, it's a great. Like it's a great venue when you get the six thousand students in there. I mean, yeah, I think nobody they, makes more noise than students. Yeah, and so when you get students. when you get that huge group of students, like when when in the in the Tony Bennett years, and even even there was you know carryover and the Clay Thompson um, as in Ken Bone up until his probably last season, they were still yep. getting like decent crowds and yep. and and I know that like. Uh, people who went to school during that time think fondly of the basketball games, even though they didn't have as much success. Like they still, they, they, you know, a lot more people went to the games. It was way, way more normal thing. But now it's like, uh, it, it's just, you know, not a thing that people go to even during Pac-12 play. And so, um, but, but I, I think it can be so easily brought back. It's, 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 it's truthfully also a lot easier to go to a basketball game than a football game. Um, it's, it's a two hour commitment versus a, 
a four hour commitment and you know it's it's you know maybe it's just on a thursday night like who cares what are you going to do like uh, you're not you're and not really your weekend once yeah, you get inside it's warm once you get inside <laughs> uh, although we we waited in line <laughs> in some cold 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 weather but uh but yeah so but you don't i mean when it's six thousand seats you really don't have to wait in line if you don't want to if you want to sit no. in the front you know and the team's good you do right you want to get your but, picture taken wearing a beanie yelling <laughs> it yelling at everybody and yeah <laughs> yeah so yeah you gotta show so, up early for that yeah you gotta show up early for that um, but yeah, so it's, you know, or, or if you want to, um, the, have the Oregon state players, like let you take jumpers for some reason, like <laughs> <laughs> always Oregon state. I don't know why. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, but it was, uh, uh, yeah, I, it, it's man, I, I hope for Pollard's sake, you know, next year they, they just get a little bit going so you can I see do that too. it doesn't take much. Absolutely. Um, cause it, it really doesn't take much, you know, it's, it, it's, it's harder to get the alumni over of course, because you know, in, in the dead of winter, it, that's a hell of a drive to make from yeah. Seattle to Pullman or even uh, Spokane. I mean, look, Spokane's an Spokane. hour or whatever away, but you know, in the dead of winter, that's, you know, that's a, that's a pretty big investment, you know, to drive an hour plus and, in on a on a sketchy highway with sketchy weather you know so i get it and as we talked about with baseball last week the dead of winter can last until like may so right (laughs) it can be the entire basketball season yeah it's you know and and the other thing i would say is this that you know i've always said the greatest crime that you know any team at all can commit is the crime of being uninteresting and, you know, the, the fans will put up with a hell of a lot if you're interesting in, in some way. I mean, they'll, they'll put up with losing. I mean, they'll put up with all kinds of stuff if you're interesting, if you give them a reason to be interested. And, you know, that was sort of what I, I think really sort of killed Ken Bone was that, you know, that last year was, was really the most painful, <laughs> you know, one of the most. And, and, and this is even in the context of, of Ernie Kent at this point. Um, you know, that was one of the most painful things I have ever, you know, witnessed was that last Ken Bones. I mean, it was slow and it was bad and it was just like, you know, whatever. And, you know, Ernie comes in that first year and they were, you know, not hor. I mean, their, their overall Ken Palm rank was bad, but, um, but they, you know, they won some games and they played a, an aesthetically pleasing style and, you know, and you could be like, okay, you know, maybe this will you know, maybe turn into something. Well, then, you know, for two years, he decided, let, let's just get slower and slower and slower and lose and lose and lose. And, and, you know, it just becomes this thing where it's like, man, it's just not interesting. And you see no, no light at the end of the tunnel. And, you know, Ernie being Ernie, you know, spent all his time telling everybody, oh, we're just about to turn the corner. And it's just like, you know, bullshit. Like, like fans aren't idiots, you know? I mean, we may not be coaches, you know, we may not understand all of the ins and outs of everything you're trying to do on the floor, but we can see stuff, <laughs> you know, and we can right. see if, if things are bad and we can see if they're, if they have any real likelihood of getting better, you know, we're not idiots. And, you know, I think and it felt like Ernie just sort of was like, you know, well, you, you know, you don't know anything. This is high. This is pretty much above your understanding. We're building something here and you can't see it, but you know, it's here and we're all just like, no, you know, so I, I, again, just kind of bringing it back around to Smith, I think, um, you know, building around the, uh, the nerd ball or data raid, I, I by the way, I, I so hope they give that up. Um, you yeah, know, brand, that, that specifically data raid, he doesn't, data you, you want him to give up data raid. Cause that, I know sounds, Kyle, like, <laughs> sounds like Gatorade. Sounds like off brand Gatorade. <laughs> I know. I can't even. I mean, I understand. Look, if he's like, if he feels like nerd ball is like a like a detriment to uh, to recruiting or something, which, you know, basically the way he's approaching it, I kind of get the feeling that's what he's implying that this whole idea of of nerds is uh, is problematic. But, um, you know, it's it, whatever it is. You know, embrace the. You know, if you embrace the brand and. Um, you know, get people to, you know, buy into that and, and just sort of sell a, a thing that they can wrap their arms around, like what Dick Bennett did, like what, you know, Mike Leach did, you know, you just give people something that they can, that they can grab onto. Um, you know, people do it, man. Cougar fans love, they, they love their teams. And, you know, I, you know, I think we've all seen that. So yeah, I listen, 
to bring it back around full circle, don't need to go to Moscow. We can build hype. Just win some damn games, and everyone will. Uh, everyone wins. Yes. Uh, exactly. Um, yeah. It, go to Moscow for uh, discount groceries at the Winco and and, and Breakfast 20, Club. And Breakfast Club. And, and yeah, by the way, Breakfast a, Club. But like, you got the money for that when you're in college. As as a certified old person, you know their farmers market is pretty badass too. So. They do have a hemp festival as well. It, I mean, I don't know is, if they still like, do. Like, Moscow's like I, I hope this doesn't come across as like Moscow sucks because Moscow definitely does not suck. Like it's like if I was you know if I was not attached to WSU in any way, and you were asking me to pick between one of the two cities, I'd probably pick Moscow. Like it's just a little bigger, you know, it's a little more adult, you know, all those things. Like so, I get it. Like I know a lot of professors live in Moscow. Like I get all that, but as a college kid, like. Psh- there ain't nothing in Moscow for me. Come on. Oh, well, I actually, I, I, you know what? One thing, when I was in college, we bought our kegs in Moscow because they were cheaper than in Washington. And that's when you could get away with carrying them over the border. So, But, but yeah, that's what you're doing. You're buying the beer over in Idaho, but to go to party. To bring it back Pullman. to Pullman. Yes, that's exactly right. And so, you know, I, I presume the statute of limitations run out on that. I hope none of my students are listening to this. And if they are, somebody else did all that. I was just along for the ride, so. Jeff doesn't drink beer. No, never. Never. <laughs> what else we got? All right, man. Well, uh, so more hot takes. More hot, hot takes. takes. We love hot takes. So, uh, shit. So once again, I am uh, the unprepared. Um, uh, which national writer? This is Dan. This- Dan Wolken from Dan USA Today. From USA Today. Dan Wolken from USA. He's kind of a hot take. He, he's kind of a hot take specialist. To yeah. Be honest. Some some have that as their their shtick. Uh, so he was unhappy with the new bowl schedule um, because uh, which isn't new um, because uh, there will be. Uh, Many games, including like the Cheese It Bowl or something like that, played after the uh, semifinals and before the finals. Uh, as we know, there's two weeks between those games in the beginning of January and the end of December. Um, so, what Dan would sounds like he would prefer is to have those two games, no games, and then. Uh, and then a championship game instead of those two games, a bunch of other college football that you could watch every single day and then a championship game. So he would yeah. prefer the, a, just a big gap where we just talk about one game and, and nothing else because that's so much fun during the Super Bowl. Like, it's just so fun how they talk about one game for two weeks, and it definitely doesn't get old after, like, three days. No, that would not get old at all. It, it, one of the weird things about this year, so I'm looking at the schedule right now. So the the semifinals are on December 28th, which is a little weird just well, because— it's a Saturday. They want them right, on Saturday. So, the, so there you go. So it's a Saturday. Um, so the Fiesta Bowl has one of the semis, and the Peach Bowl has the other. Um, and they're on Saturday. So I, So I get that. Um, and then the, uh, the actual championship is not until January 13th. So you've got actually more than two full weeks between the semis and the final, which by the way, I don't necessarily object to because, um, you know, if you're a fan and you're going from one game to the next, potentially, oh, yeah. you know, having a couple of weeks to, to figure your stuff out is, is probably a pretty great idea. So, so like, I don't think any of that is necessarily a bad idea. Um, I, you know, I don't think having two weeks off in between is a bad idea. Apparently what Dan doesn't like is that there are games in between them, such as like December 30th, the serve pro first responder bowl, the Franklin American mortgage music city bowl. Um, the orange bowl is now on December 30th. And then on New Year's Eve, you've got the Belk Bowl, the Liberty Bowl, the Alamo Bowl. And then on New Year's, you've got the Citrus Bowl, the Outback Bowl, the Rose Bowl, the Sugar Bowl, which is a pretty typical, you know, New Year's Day uh, lineup. Unfortunately, by the way, only four games on New Year's Day now, which 
sort of blows, but whatever. Uh, January 2nd, Birmingham Bowl, Tax Slayer Gator Bowl. So this is where I think he has the problem, right? So you've got January 1st has, has pretty much a normal, and, and New Year's Eve also has pretty much a normal uh, New Year's or normal, you know, schedule. And then, so then after that, then you've got all these, what I think he would consider filler games between uh, the the sort of New Year's games and then the championship, which is the Birmingham Bowl, the Tax Slayer Gator Bowl, the famous Idaho Potato Bowl, the Lockheed Martin Armed Forces Bowl, the Mobile Alabama Bowl. Um, so how do you feel, Craig, about there being football in between the semifinal and the final versus there being no football between the semifinal and the final. I mean, I love bowl season when you're just like you're off work or even during work and there's just some random ass football game on near on like a Tuesday and you're like, hell yeah, I'm watching this. Um, or, or, you know, maybe you're off work because, you know, you, you had some vacation days to burn that you're not going to roll over or whatever, or you're a teacher and you don't work right then. Yep. Um, uh, so yeah, like, yeah, I'm, I'm totally for that. The one thing that I'm mad about is why, is, why aren't any of the pac 12 tie-ins after the new year's, you know, why can't we get one of those later games? Why does the Rose, like, I feel like maybe we got to have the Rose bowl as the last one. That's just how it is. Um, but I would love, you know, why can't the Alamo bowl be on, you know, or, or even the, uh, you know, what, what even, uh, the, whatever the chicken bowl is called now um or the you know the cactus bowl or something have that be on january 5th or whatever yeah i'd totally be down for that um it, it kind of sucks how the pac-12 crams all their pretty much crams all their uh bowl games into the from like you know roughly the 20th to the to the first um but yeah but but it, but yeah i'm totally down let, let, give me that football i don't care if it's i don't care if it's middle tennessee state Versus Bowling Green, I think they're in the same conference, so they would play. But but no, maybe they aren't. Uh, Middle Tennessee State versus Bowling Green or whatever. I don't I don't care. Like uh, give it to me. It's the only time I see these teams all year. I don't want them playing all at the same time. Like spread those games out. Yeah, uh, I I don't know if that's even like, I like I don't know if that's something we can blame Larry Scott for or not, or if that's just sort of dumb luck. I'm not, I'm not even sure. But well, anyway, I just, continue. I would not be surprised if it's the Rose Bowl is like we must be the last Pac-12 bowl. Although I are I think those, that's possible. Yeah, like because yeah, the 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 Pac the Pac-12 will bend at whatever whatever the Rose Bowl wants to do, but wait for when it's the Rose Bowl's turn to be maybe they planned out the days like maybe they planned out the rotation so that the rose bowl always happens as a semifinal on new year's i don't know but like as I, I i just the fit that people would throw if it was on the 28th or the 29th or the third or even new year's eve um but yeah we'll see well wait, where when, when it when it was the uh semis for um florida state and Florida State and because uh, that was another one someone brought up like oh could the Rose Bowl not be on on New Year's Day what, what was the semi when it was wasn't it Rose Bowl when it was Florida State Jameis Winston and Oregon yeah I think that's right so what day was that on because that was one of Wilkins uh, points like it's like oh how would, they would never do this to the Rose Bowl yeah, I'm try- I didn't even read his story. I just like no, I, was, I saw was, his hot his, take his, tweets and I was it was like, his tweet thread. He oh, I didn't. That. Maybe I didn't make it that far. Then I don't know. He just like he threw out like his his terrible take and then had about a dozen tweets after oh, that. That was on trying January first. And I was like, whatever. That like, was on January first. So I wonder if they will make the rotation so that the Rose Bowl is always on New Year's Day based on the calendar. Because they're always. It seems like they'll always have it on Saturday. They'll always have the the semifinals on Saturday. Yeah. Because they don't, I, they don't want to go up against uh, the foot, the NFL football. Yeah. Which I mean, you know, makes sense. I mean, Saturday is your traditional college football day. Like, like I get all that. So that all makes sense. And by the way, for Mr. Dan Wolken, the last bowl game before the championship is on January 6th. So we do even still have an entire week. Entire week. You know, football but it's which which i say absolutely sucks like like that sucks i'm gonna have an entire week with no football no college football so screw that but whatever 
Unless, Whatever, which, I mean, I, I guess I won't be too sad when the Cougars are in the CFP championship, and, and then I'll have that to look forward to. You just have that week to just bask in that glory. That's right. Yeah. All the Mike Leach stories and everything else that'll be going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. going to be so, I don't know. Fun. I mean, yeah. listen, like Dan Wolken's like the kind of guy who's like, there are too many bowl games, right? I mean, that's. I mean, that's sort of the deal, right? You know, bowl games have lost all their meaning because there's too many of them. And it's like, dude, who doesn't like more football? Like, come on. Like, who doesn't like more football? I mean, most of the time, like almost every time, the players, like there's there are exceptions because players may feel slighted because they wanted like a, a nicer bowl game. But that also shows that they care about all the bowl games. Like, like it really mattered to WSU players that they were in the Alamo Bowl and not, you know, a lower bowl like the Foster Farms Bowl or whatever it's called now, um, the 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 one that's in Santa Clara. Like so, so that it, that made a big deal to them. And and technically, the Alamo Bowl is one of those games that doesn't matter, even though it's usually ranked teams. But it doesn't matter. Like it doesn't make any difference. Um, but it, but you know, it and and the uh, you, you, the there's all these like smaller ball games that pit um, sort of mid mate. We don't really have that term, but like group of five, I guess like teams against other group of five teams. And uh, they, those bowl games matter to them. Um, the players like it. The players, it's like one of the few times a year, the players are allowed to like, you know, get rewarded other than like for their success with like gifts you know, like they, cause they get the bowl game yeah. gifts, you know, and they they they, uh, they they get to travel and and go somewhere new. They get they get this like week long celebration instead of like you know just football game after football game or football game. Like they get it they get a different place and 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 if you know if occasionally a five and seven team is playing a bowl game because we have so many bowl games and so be it whatever a five and seven team played in the bowl game and and um, yeah. It, 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 I don't know, like being a college football athlete, it's pretty grinding. Um, it's nice if, you know, they, it's, it's not like it's every single team athletes. It's like, yeah, they don't deserve it. It's like, well, like, do, does the guys on Alabama just deserve it more? Like, because they're like more physically gifted and we're like five-star recruits and it's like, it's so colossally <laughs> stupid. Yeah. Like I don't, yeah. That's, I'm, you could go out. I could rant on this, but like, it's, yeah. you know, it's whatever, like have more bowl games. We get to watch the bowl games. The players get to participate in the bowl games. They get to be celebrated. They get to feel loved and wanted. And they, they, and and you know it's it's a it, it's a fun time. It's fun going to the bowl games, even when your team gets embarrassed in, in, yeah. in by Minnesota or whatever. Um, but but it's like it's uh it, it it's fun and and you know it's fun for the alumni if it's you know they travel and they get to hang out in a city and they take over bars and stuff and whatever like it that. It, it it gives money to those economies. I oh, yeah, what, what's I the mean, downside? I, I mean, exactly. You, you I, could you could have this longer argument about maybe we should play less football in general. I, I mean, because, I challenge but, anyone to come up with any legitimate argument as to how it's bad. Like like you can you literally cannot come up with an argument, a legitimate argument as to how it's a bad thing. Like. The best anyone can come up with is, oh, it's just like the wussification of America where everyone gets a participation trophy. And it's like, you know what? You know, only idiots who haven't played um, athletics at a high level would say that this is a participation trophy. Because if you've spent any time – and look, not to say that I have because I have not. But I've spent a lot of time around players who have. Um, you know, having been a, a journalist and spending, you know, as a as a college student, been around, you know, athletes who were on the team and understanding what is asked of them uh, to be able to do that. Listen, winning six football games is fucking hard. <laughs> and let's just like recognize how many teams do it and how many teams don't and the amount of time that gets put into making that happen. And when teams do it, you know what? More power to them. Go to your bowl game. I don't even care which one it is, if it's some sort of, you know, the famous Idaho potato bowl, you know, whatever it is, um, you know, go to your bowl game and have a good time. And, and, and by the way, I'm one of, you know, this, you know, I'm one of the loudest, like 
people who says like bowl games don't really mean anything. You know, like I will say, you know, as, as loud as, as I can say it as high as from as high a mountaintop as I can find the bowl games are fairly meaningless in terms of any kind of like predictive value or anything like that, but they are not meaningless to the players, to the coaches, to the people who invested in getting there. And, you know, when you look at what say the Cougars, when they won the Alamo bowl and you look at all those pictures and I see them all the time. because I have a whole bunch of them saved up as desktop photos that show up on my computer desktops. You know, and when those photos pop up of the guys, you know, celebrating after the game balloons in the air, you know, they're wearing the t-shirts and the hats. And I'm just like, you know what? Don't even, you can't even tell those guys, Oh, it doesn't really mean anything because really it's just an exhibition. You didn't win your conference or anything like that. So, it's really just not that big of a deal. It's just like, you know, like, no, like it matters to them. You know, those guys put in a ton of time, put in a ton of effort. Like, even though they are the weirdest games where results are super unpredictable and the outcome doesn't really tell you anything going forward, the result in and of itself matters to the guys who play and it matters to the fans. And does does it really need anything more than that? I don't think so. You know, I mean, it's okay that it's it's just sort of a weird exhibition, and um, you know, when a team wins, it feels real good. And and believe me, when uh, when I get on the SB Nation email threads, and Iowa State, you know, says something like, "Hey, look, we had a Cougar loose in uh, in Ames." With this, this is legit, by the way. They say, you know, we had a Cougar loose in Ames, so we wrote a post about it and did like a thing like this Cougar showing up at different parts of Ames. And I send an email back that says, hey, we just wanted to check up on you, make sure you were okay after losing the Alamo Bowl. And then the guy responds like, that's just cold. Like it matters. It matters, you know, like it's it doesn't matter, but it matters. You know what I mean? Man, it really mattered to those Iowa State Oh, man, it mattered to them. It feels so good that I was able to tweak him like that. I felt, oh, I felt so good. Anyway, it's just, you know, like the bowl games are good and, and it's fun. And, and, you know, anybody who's like, there's too many bowl games or, you know, why are we having games after New Year's Day? Like, whatever, man, just, you know, New Year, it doesn't diminish New Year's Day. It doesn't diminish the semis. Everybody's going to watch those games like they always would. And just the fact there are other games, you just go, OK, great. There's other games. Awesome. Now I get to watch, you know, something else. I come home and there's a game on it, you know, five o'clock or whatever. And you know, yay, more college football. And it doesn't even matter. Like I can tell you right now, I will watch the Belk Bowl. I don't even know who's playing. I won't know who's playing for whatever, you know, however many months from now, eight months or whatever. Like I will watch the Belk Bowl. Why? Because it's on. That's why. So. So yes, uh, podcast versus everyone. Very much pro bowl games after the semis. Hell yeah, we are. So, yeah. Um, what else we got? You got any good kid stories? Well, I, uh, yeah, I guess I could say. Uh, I mean, you took me uh, to another, like, five sporting events. You could talk about any of those. Yeah, you know, it's just, <laughs> I like going to sporting events, and uh, Amanda she will. She likes hanging out with Daddy, so it's a yeah, win-win. Yeah, and Amanda, and she likes going, Assad, Assad, um, <laughs> as she says. Um, and it. she likes bah, bah, bah. and she likes bah, people bah. yelling and clapping. It's fun. Oh, it's very exciting. Um, and but uh, you know, and and it gives us something to do rather than just sit around the house or you know uh, stare at the dogs or whatever. Um, oh, yeah. But but uh, yeah, so we went to on, on Memorial Day the uh, Seattle Rain uh, or not? They're not called Seattle Rain anymore. They play in Tacoma. They're called Rain FC. Rain FC. Um, but do, by the way, do all of our listeners know who Rain FC is? Definitely not. Uh, they are the uh, they're uh, uh, the the professional women's soccer. Um, what is it? The United Women's Soccer League? No, National Women's Soccer League. Um, uh, so honestly, like a lot of the you know, best uh, women's players in the world play in this league. Um, uh, I watch. Uh, we also have the Sounders uh, second uh, USL uh, USL championship team in uh in tacoma and i will say that um from a a, just a quality standpoint the uh the rain probably beat them (laughs) like pretty regularly um like just when like from a pure soccer quality standpoint uh they're definitely like better players and uh so you because you got a lot of you get players on these teams that are on uh world cup winning 
uh, soccer teams and, and stuff. So, um, p- p- the compete in the world cup and all that. And, and, uh, I would say that, uh, on a, from an international perspective, the U S has a much stronger, uh, women's soccer presence, obviously, since they've won two world cups, uh, than the men's soccer presence. So it's a really fun, uh, league to watch. And, uh, the B has been to two rain matches. They've won them both. Um, uh, they scored a late goal to kind of clinch it. And although it did, there was definitely some stress after that, but, um, but she, uh, she was getting tired and she was in her, uh, so we got these tickets where if you've ever been to Cheney stadium, they have these party decks and like people can book like parties there. Well, they made this special where you could pay for a ticket and you get like, you know, they have like hot dogs and hamburgers, unlimited all you want. And then they had like beer and wine. Um, all you wanted during the game. So I was like, oh, cool. I'll just buy that. And, you know, I, I'm not going to grill out for just myself on Memorial Day. Amanda's working. Um, so I had, a, I, had a, I had a hot dog, you know, some macaroni salad or whatever. Um, can you guess, Jeff, what the only beer on offer was? Uh, Coors Light. Bingo. So <laughs> I, had four, I had four Coors Lights, which on that 77 degree day um, was just fine. Um uh and uh but you know shameful to admit i know uh but yeah i mean i had paid for that unlimited beer so i had four of them um i could have had a lot more uh for sure but i was you know, i had a daughter to walk home with um but uh yeah so we went to that uh she gets really excited you know the chanting the clapping you know at soccer matches and then her mom was getting really jealous and i was all having all these fun experiences um, like when we went to the Mariners game last weekend and she met the moose and she was so excited. So her mom really wanted to go to, she had this, you know, days off this week, wanted to go to a Mariners game. Um, so we went last night or which was, uh, which would be Tuesday night. Um, so they got Mariners got stomped, uh, 11 to whatever. It was 11 zero at one point Rangers. Um, uh, but yes, yeah, so we, we get in, um, uh, we're walking in, we're walk. we got there early and we went down to the pen and just, uh, you know, look for a beer. We actually didn't buy one down there. I went and grabbed another one of those, uh, Kentucky breakfast stouts. We got a few, we got some of the last ones. They were sold out. Um, it's the best be- deal in the ballpark. I was say, everyone else recognized yeah, the value too, yeah, apparently. Yeah, exactly. So it was better value than the $7 smaller beers. I would say like they have the $7 beers in the pen, um, for a happy hour up until an hour before the game the cups are definitely smaller. Like, like I can tell just really, I'm like this, they're probably just half the size and like, it's not even a good deal. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, but so we, we kind of bailed on that, but as we were walking down into the pen right next to the actual bullpen, this guy, I don't know, bullpen catcher, Mariner staff or whatever, uh, calls Amanda who's carrying B in like a front pack over and hands B a, a, a major league baseball from batting practice. Oh, and so B, you know, who loves ball, 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 ball. She's so excited. Uh, she threw it on the ground a couple of times. So we had to kind of take it away from her. Um, but because we were there so early, we went and saw the moose again. And she got her ball signed by the moose. And uh, um, I took a picture of her getting her ball signed by the moose. Um, that ended up on the big screen before the game. On the, you know, that like hashtag where I root or whatever. Um, so B got on the big screen that time. And then later, she was just, we were in the the club. We got some really cheap off like game time or whatever club, like club tickets. And, uh, uh, and you know, it was a pretty sparsely uh, attended uh, Tuesday night game. And a lot of people that get the club tickets just kind of don't even bother going to their seats. Um, they just hang out up and, you know, up in the club and, and enjoy the bar and then whatever. Um, so, uh, 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 B was, uh, you know, had free reign and was running around really hyped, lo- enjoying the music, enjoying, you know, everything. Um, so at one point, um, the uh, a cameraman just comes over, sits directly in front of B and points his camera at B. And and so uh, so she gets up on the big screen, just her big her face. She, of course, gets shy and won't like do any of her cheering or anything. So they didn't leave her on there very often. But so in B, like, she's not even two yet. She gets, you know, people love, you know, they want to get on the Jumbotron. 
at the at the uh, do they still call it the jumbotron? I don't know. They want to get on the jumbotron at, at at the game. She's already got. She did that twice. Uh, they want to catch a ball. They got. She got a ball. Man, she she's just already like ticking boxes, and she is not even two yet. And so I'm pretty jealous of her. Like I I've never gotten a major league baseball, so I'm not even a batting practice one. Um, so I, I don't think I've been early. Never. To- wait, wait, wait. Never. Never. I, well, I've not never- even. Like not even like like a ball landed somewhere. I mean, I've caught a home run ball during batting practice. Well, but you've I, never I even had this, one like, just like how, bounce near you. You know how early you have to go to the game to even catch the I, opposing team's and batting I will practice? say this. Like it was it's not as easy anymore as it used to be. They don't open the gates quite as early. Like well, they, I, I will they say open th- the gates earlier, but I think they take batting practice earlier now. Maybe that's like, it. We got there two hours before and the Rangers were like wrapping up batting practice yeah i mean we used to so when i was a kid we used to go and and like that was part of the attraction was we get there for batting practice and you know sit in the outfield and try and catch actually that's not an attraction as an adult and i haven't been like i've most of the games that i've went to have been as an adult yeah and so like watching bp like is not as i don't know it's not that not as interesting it was really weird when we were there that early uh we just kind of tried we we kind of overestimated the Seattle traffic coming up and it didn't turn out to be as bad as we thought. So we were, and we, we were there a little earlier and we were like, all right, you know, we'll just go in. Um, and yeah, they were taking BP and I kind of realized that in all the games I go to, I think I went to like 10 or 11 last year. This is my third one this year. And, and, I, um, and I, I, I haven't seen BP in a long time cause you have to go like two hours, like just to catch the tail end, um, two hours, so, yeah, so she got and I saw, you know, I saw the kids out there, you know, on the foul lines in in, in right field, you know, c- catching fly balls and stuff. So, yeah, I'd never I've never got a ball. Um, I haven't been to, truthfully that many games in my life. But, um, you know, I, I, well, as a kid, I wasn't and no one's handing a, a, an adult a baseball. Um, but, uh, yeah, so but B just took her, you know, just looking cute and she got one. But that's what's so cool about like, you know, you and I as adults, I mean, it's, you know, you, you actually grew up in Eastern Washington, you know, so the opportunity to go to games was, was a lot less, but, you know, I grew up 15 minutes North of Seattle, but, you know, my family was of, you know, such means that, you know, we didn't go to a ton of games. It was like once or twice a year as, as a special thing. I mean, I was just talking with Sarah about this the other day, you know, when it was, when it was go to the Mariners night. Um, you know, we would spend a couple hours basically making hot dogs, wrapping them in foil and then popping popcorn to put into a bag to take into the game. And then, and then we would buy one large soda for the whole family to share. Like that was, that was so like the idea of like buying concessions was like, I mean, that just wasn't even a thing that oh, we yeah. considered, you yeah. know? And, and so, um, you know, when, when I would go to game, when I became an adult and I would go to games, like at first I was like, I just won't ever buy food or concessions. Like, that's just, like, that's just so expensive, you know? But now like my kids, my kids are so damn spoiled and, and not, and I don't mean that in a bad way. Like, I don't mean that, like, like there's something wrong with that. Like, like I want to do that, you know? And like for B, it's the same thing. I mean, she's going to grow up thinking this is totally normal and not just going to games, but like the idea of going to watch, you know, a professional women's soccer team, you know I mean? All this cool stuff that, that she's going to get to experience stuff that my kids have gotten to experience, you know, both, um, through games that I've been able to take them to. And then, you know, experiences that, you know, Tristan and his brothers have had because of, you know, being a cancer survivor, you know, things like that, you know, there's all these things that they've gotten to do that's just sort of normal. And I'm just like, and it's funny too, cause they'll just be like, oh yeah, you know, we, that time we went to the Seahawks practice and got like, you know, 15, you know, signatures and got to hug Russell Wilson and, and Tristan will just be like, yeah, it was cool. You know, and I'm just like, oh my God, like my head just explodes. I'm like, I, you know, as a kid, I would have killed for something like that. So anyway, I don't know. I guess what I'm saying in a roundabout way is, is you and I are the American dream, Craig. We oh, are yeah. the American dream. Yeah. So yeah, it's funny. It's funny. Like, like, so as someone brought up on the thread, I sent a picture that B was at the game the other time. Like that kid has been to like, like that kid has already been to more games than I ever went to as a kid. And I'm like, yeah, like, you know, I grew up in Eastern Washington. Like my first game I went to when I was, was when I was 11. And then we went to like maybe three more while I was in high school. And, uh, you know, when I moved to Seattle, when I was right out of WSU, uh, 
and there was like six dollar centerfield bleacher tickets i i would go and you could go down to the mariners team store downtown and just buy you know like tickets without any extra fees i would go to like i'd make a point to go like 20 games a year and i was like this is so cool i could go 20 mariners games a year and i used to go to like you know like one every three years maybe and uh and so it, yeah going to mariners games i still enjoyed it but it's like even for me it's become like you know i go to like at least like 10 a year and uh i usually do it at this point on a whim and and um so it's not like you know back like you said we'd have to load up we we'd we'd bring our own or we or, or we you know we'd buy the peanuts outside make sure we did that we'd buy all the snacks outside where oh, they were yeah, like 100% and, yeah. we we absolutely and, did that too yeah and you we would get like you know we'd go on like uh family nights or whatever or we'd get some like i remember one the first game we went to we got the tickets for free for buying like two packs of listerine or something like and so we got four tickets to Mariners game. And so that's why we went to the Mariners game. Or we go over on a weeknight when they would have like a uh you know a a four they used to have like the four for fifty where you got like hot dog and popcorn and pop. Like so we, we would surf for the deals. And now like Amanda and I go in there and we're like, What do we want to eat? Like it's Safeco Field. They have like every goddamn thing you can want to eat here. Yep. Like we by the way, we got the Vogie Hoagie, pretty damn oh. good. I kind of want good. that now, especially after yeah, that no. Homer the other night. That was, oh man, yeah. That we didn't was even talk pretty, about that, but whatever. That was a pretty tasty sandwich. I, I so it's uh, it was uh, it's like a smoked uh, smoked prime rib, um, and then um, uh, chipotle sauce, uh, uh, um, two types of cheese. There was cheddar, and then there was um, oh, I don't know if you ever familiar with this um. Uh, there's this uh, local soft, uh, kind of the soft uh, cheese that's delicious. They have it at the beer bar I go to. I can't remember what it's called, but that that was on it. And then there's chipotle sauce and cilantro, and it was just de- it was delicious. We we thought it was gonna be huge, so we split one, but we definitely could have eaten one each. Um, but yeah, it was just, you know delicious sandwich. And then B got you know her regular chicken strips. You know she, she's she, this is like a normal thing for her to go to these games and just. She she probably like she knows like going to sporting events and, and, and like, you know, big time sporting events, too. You know, she goes to Sounders matches and, right. and Mariners matches and, and games. And, and, you know, even like, um, you know, grew up in Yakima, I had to, like the, we had the Yakima Bears. But like going to Cheney Stadium is a completely different experience than going to the stadium in Yakima, which is like all bleachers. And like it wasn't, you know, it wasn't that big of a deal. It was like a step above a high school game, you know. And then, but now Cheney Stadium is like, it's pretty nice. Like you, there's a lot of different food. There's a lot of different, you know, uh, uh, beers. And there's a lot, like the seats are, you know, legit. And, and there's, there's, they have a, you know, the, the Rainiers have a mascot, you know, this little reindeer guy and, and like, um, but yeah, so it's, you know, it's, it, and we live within walking distance to that. So she's going to go to that all the time. Um, and she, and they're going to have a, a, a new soccer specific stadium, at some point, they're tearing out those, those. I don't know if you're familiar with the softball fields near near uh, Foss High School. Uh, they're tearing all those out and putting a soccer specific stadium in there, with like restaurants and and yep. stuff. So it's like it's, it's gonna, gonna be super legit. cool. Yeah, it's gonna be awesome. Like we're very excited. I we, look forward to going to many games with you. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, it is kind of awkward, like uh, the soccer uh, in the 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 seating in um in Cheney is kind of weird for soccer. Uh, there's there's a group of hardcore fans like for the the rain that you know there's that like R bar that that kind of looks over the field uh, that's like prime seating and so people just get there early and camp out like right there and just like take a seat uh, at the rail right there and just like look out over like they buy tickets wherever and so you see that a lot like people aren't in their seats because uh, they they get like about three thousand people at the matches but a lot of them are up at the bar because it's a much better view. Um, than, than like, you know, the behind home plate. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, it's pretty interesting. Um, I, I like having it, you know, I like having there. It's just another thing to do and, and, uh, an experience for B and, uh, something we can do on the weekends, but I'm rambling now. Uh, did Jeff, did you have a kid thing to talk about? I know you kind of did talk about your kids there, but. Uh, no, that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty much it. I mean, it's, you know, like 
it's just kind of fun that we get to, uh, you know, give our kids stuff that our parents couldn't give us. Um, you know, and we weren't, you know, we weren't poor by any means, but, um, you know, we were definitely sort of lower middle class and, um, you know, my, my parents always tried to, to give us as much as they could. And, and as I got older, they were able to do more, but, um, you know, I don't know, just like, I kind of love the idea of, you know, being able to provide my kids with, um, experiences and, and, and just, you know, I'm not so much into the stuff, but experiences mostly that, that I, you know, things I didn't really get to experience. And, and it's both sort of awesome and terrible that they, a lot of the stuff we, we do, you know, if I take one of them to a, you know, to a Seahawks game, for example, I mean, I don't think I went to my first Seahawks game until I was, Boy, I might have been in college before I went to a Seahawks game. My dad used to take me to Husky games, but um, and and that'll be our little secret. But um, Seahawks games, I don't think I went to until until a bit later, you know, because they were just always sold out while I was growing up. And my dad had season tickets for him that he shared with with another guy, um, so I never got to go, you know. So when I finally got to go, it was like super special and, and really, really cool. Well, my kids have gotten to, I mean, geez, Joshua went to, you know, Seahawks games when he was one, right? Like when he was B's age, it was just like, you know, it's like, my gosh, like, it's just, it, it's both awesome and terrible that they just sort of shrug, you know, I'll be like, Hey, you want to go to this, this game? And they're like, yeah, and nah, you know, and I'm just like, Oh my God, like I would have killed, I would have killed. But, but it's also, I also kind of like the fact that, um, you know, that, that their experience is such that, you know, that it's not necessarily special that they, they've, you know, gotten to experience a lot of cool stuff. So, um, you know, so that part's cool. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm glad for that. And, and whenever I see you with B, it sort of reminds me of when, uh, particularly when we just had Joshua, which, you know, was our, is our oldest, um, you know, when we just had one and all the things I could do when we just had one, <laughs> You know, oh, yeah. I, could do, and, and, I could do a lot more things when I just had one, man. Let me tell well, you. Well, yeah, I know. And taking <laughs> and taking B, it's like I can put her in the stroller. I can put her on the front pack. I, I don't have to pay for her tickets yet. Like it's not even it's not even an extra cost to bring her. And she just enjoys it so much. I mean, it is because I'm like buying uh, moose dolls and, and whatever else. But but it's really not like I'm I'm. It's probably less, like, because I'm probably drinking less beer than I would, like, if, if 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 I was just there by myself. So, so yeah, it works out in that way. Um, but yeah, dude, uh, I, I, it's great. You know, I, I think, you know, uh, uh, Amanda and I just bought a brand new car tonight. So, like, my parents would have never done that. Like, we we never could afford that growing up. But it's it's a it's a different thing. There's a it's, it's a lot, you know, to uh, to think about um, a lot to appreciate of, you know, what your parents did and, and all that. We're kind of ending on a sappy note here, but um, yeah. But, yeah. but it's, I mean, I think we both sort of feel the same way too, that like, you know, we, we both know that our parents did what they could, you know? And so we appreciated the things that, you know, that we did get to do. And, you know, even though it wasn't nearly with the frequency that, well, like I was kind of joking, like, you know, you sitting in seats with B, you know, down in the first level, I'm like, man, I don't think I sat in the first level for a Mariners game until I was like 25 or something. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. I always sat in the bleachers oh, yeah. in left field in, in the kingdom. Like, that was that was where we sat, you know. Like, like the idea of sitting down there was like, that just was not even in the round. Like, it was, it was basically the same as, like, buying concession food. Like, even just like a, like a horrible-ass king dog, you know. Like, that just wasn't even... Uh, that wasn't even the realm of possibility. So, you know, I don't know. Like, I just, um, you know, I'm thankful for the experiences that I got growing up. And, and I'm also thankful that that I'm able to do some cool stuff with with my kids. So, yeah, my my dad had my dad, my parents had a knack of getting just random free tickets from people. I don't know how like we got we sat in the suites like at, at Safeco in like 2000. Holy but hell. It's so funny. Like. We couldn't afford to buy anything like you had to buy. It wasn't like sweet, but you got like free food. Like it was like you had to buy like eight of something if you bought something. Right. So I remember we like left the found like a like a concession stand, and like bought like the cheapest hot dogs we could find and all that. But yeah, so we got um, there was one time I got to because I was working um, in like a event marketing company and we had a partnership with uh, to. Tacoma, we got to sit in the 
Como suite for a weekend and I just drank as much free beer as I possibly could. But yeah, we did that one year. We, we never went to a game where we had, the tickets were actually bought by us. Like it was always someone gave us tickets, usually in the upper level, but that one time was in the suites. And then we had this guy that uh, my dad knew that had season tickets to the Seahawks. And I think like twice while I was growing up, um, I got to go to a Seahawks game. I, I got to see Rick Meyer um, throw three picks against there the Chargers um, in, I believe, 95. Yeah. Um, and uh, my dad got – oh, and then there was another game. I, I don't remember <laughs> the game too well, but I do remember it was a Sunday night game. And someone told my dad on the way out to go back to Yakima, oh, to avoid traffic – Drive down to 18 and come back up. <laughs> so there was a wreck going I-5 South. It yeah. took us three hours to get to Highway 18. Oh, dear This God. is obviously before Google Maps or anything. Yeah, yeah. So we're just in it. My, I would fall asleep for like 20 minutes. I'd wake up and we would be like an inch. Like forward. five inches farther. Yeah, down. yeah. And my dad, my poor dad, who um, we're getting home at like, you know, at best case scenario after the Sunday night Seahawks game, we're getting home at like midnight. Best and he's going case. and he's going he's getting up at like six to go to work and then but i think we got back at like three and he went to work the next day Ugh. so yeah but uh um, i don't know he wasn't a wuss like you and i where we could just be like we're sick like you actually have to go to work to get paid yeah i'd be like yeah now i'd be like uh <laughs> I'll, I'll 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 uh I'll i would have been can't. like I gotta I'd be cancel that 8 a.m. call. Yeah, I'd be sitting there in traffic and I'd whip out my phone and be like, I am sick tomorrow. <laughs> like, yes. like I'd be putting in for my sub while sitting behind the wheel of, of the car as I'm sitting in traffic. Yep. All right, man. All right. Is that good? We cover everything? It's good. I, it, we, we, we still almost pushed an hour 40. Not so, bad. not too so, bad. Not too bad. Um, but yeah. Um, all right, everyone. Thanks for listening. Um, any questions, comments, suggestions? Uh, uh, we got some this week. Um, I see you, man. Uh, I, um, let's see. Uh, uh, we'll talk about some some uh, uh, Cougar golf stars. Yeah, we got to do a little research on that. Gotta do, that's we that's do a the problem. Research. We weren't I, we weren't really ready. We weren't for really that. prepared. Um, I, I checked. You sent the email six days ago, but I, I just now checked it. So, um, <laughs> but if you keep sending me emails, people, I will check it more frequently. We'll check it more frequently if you so, send if you email us more frequently. Podcast podcast versus everyone at gmail dot com. Um, also um, at pod versus everyone on the twitters at Craig at I can't I, I don't know why I can never say it at the Craig Powers the Craig, like the Craig Powers. At the Craig Powers on Twitter, um, uh, or um, Craig W Powers on Instagram, if you want to see what me and B are up to and what yeah. beers I'm drinking. Um, yeah, so uh, I think that's all. Um, donate to our Patreon. We don't have a Patreon. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but do give us a five star rating. Oh yes, we That'd haven't even cool. asked that. We haven't asked that in like a month. Uh, yeah, know. can you? Can you please uh, rate us five stars, whatever you're on? Leave a nice comment. It says, like, yeah. uh, Jeff has a, a pretty face. Um, <laughs> I, don't I mean, know. you don't Sometimes, have to lie. I mean, We're not but asking you're, you to you're, lie. You're, listening, you're listening on a podcast. You don't know what his face looks like. You don't know if that's really us. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, maybe that's some other some other bearded, drunk dudes at a Cougar football game. Maybe my name isn't Craig Bowers. Maybe not. Maybe it's just a nom de plume. Yeah, whatever the fuck that is. It's French for assumed name or something. Sure. Yeah. You could have said assumed name. <laughs> that's true. I could have said that. <laughs> Aren't you an English teacher, Jeff? I am. That's why I, say, teacher. that's why I say nom de plume. Nom de plume. All right, man. All right. All great. right. Thank you, everyone. Go Cougs. Go Cougs.